Good morning, everyone. Welcome to United Bethel Church. I pray that as the new year comes, that it will be an abundant and a fresh new year. So let's just give our hearts and our minds to worship the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 
Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is Forever God is with us Forever, forever Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is with us Forever, forever, forever
Happy New Year, everyone. morning. Let me greet you all first. A happy new year. Taike Sini Kwailok. Today is the second day of the year 2022. The first Sunday of the year 2022. And later, we will have our first Sunday communion for the year 2022. Hope everybody will be able to prepare their flakes and juice. Does anyone know the sign for this year, 2022? It's the year of the tiger. Does anyone in our midst born in the year of the tiger? In our Asian Chinese belief, there are several kinds of tiger. Wood tiger, fire tiger, earth tiger, and water tiger. For this year, it's the water tiger. But I'm not going to share to you about tiger this morning. Last year, our late Pastor Dimwell shared to us three-year vision plan and theme for UBC: unity, build, and care. For this year, 2020-22. We will be focusing on the team build for the first quarter of this year, from January to March. We will be focusing on our faith building journey. Our second quarter, for from April to June, will be on our life building journey, and on the third quarter and fourth quarter, we will be discussing on our. Character building. This morning, as to start our first quarter team faith building, we will be studying on the book of Romans. I will be sharing to you the first chapter of the book of Romans, chapter one, verses one to seventeen, and I will share to you a short introduction of this book before we continue. Shall we all come together? In the presence of the Lord and pray, Father, we thank you, Lord God, uh, for this first Sunday of the year 2022 that we were able to gather together in your presence, Lord God, as we as a fresh start uh, this year, Lord God, as we will have our new uh, lessons and sharing uh, for, from the book of Romans, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for. 2021, Lord, how you have uh, taught us uh, in the book of uh, Philippians, Lord, we have uh, learned a lot, and now we will uh, study a new episodes, Lord God. May your wisdom, Lord God, uh, anoint us, Lord God, and all those listener uh, this morning, Lord, will be blessed, and as well bless your words, anoint your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The Book of Romans, 
or the epistles of Romans. The author of this epistle was Saul, in which was originally named in Acts 7.58. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. You can also check in Acts 8.1. Then Saul was changed to Paul. In Acts 13.9, it says, But Saul, who has also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. The name Saul was a Hebrew name, while the name Paul was Roman. During the Roman time, to address in a letter, it would be better uh, to make use of the name which they were accustomed to and which would excite no prejudice among, among them. You can also see Romans uh, 1.1, 1, 1, where in the beginning of, the, the, of his letter, Paul introduced himself. The place and date of the book of Romans uh, was clearly written from Corinth during uh, Paul's third missionary journey. Paul had never visited Rome, but after fulfilling his mission trip to Jerusalem, Paul hoped to go to Roman in route to Sp Spain. You can also check this in Romans 15. Uh, verses 23 to 25. And the book was probably written in 60 AD. In some, they said in somewhere 56 to 58 AD. The recipient of the letter and purpose of the letter. The recipient of the letter was to the Roman believers. But best to say or to see that it was written to a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles with majority. Paul's purpose in writing was to proclaim the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ by teaching a sound doctrine of the gospel and edify and encourage the believers to correct their attitude and behavior in the church. The theme of the book of Romans centers on the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, 17. Paul is deeply concerned that his readers must understand how a sinner may be received as righteous by a righteous God and how a justified sinner should live daily to the glory of God. Let me give you a, an outline of the episodes of Romans. From chapter 1 to 117, uh, start with the introduction. From one, chapter 1, eight, 18 to chapter 3, uh, talks about human sinfulness. From chapter 3, to five, the gospel answer. And as we go on, chapter six to chapter eight, from the death of life. And as we continue, chapter nine to 11, uh, Israel's and the Gen Gentiles. And chapter 12 to 15, uh, it deals with the Christians living. 15, chapter 15, uh, it talks about personal plans. And from the last chapter 16, it's uh, um, conclusion and greetings. Last year, we have learned the epistles of Philippians, how Paul wrote his ep epistles to the Philippians church. 
the pattern of his letter, the salutation or greetings, follows the normal letter pattern of the writer to recipients and greetings. Paul uses the first section in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 16, to introduce both himself and the gospel he proclaimed. The recipient in chapter 1, 7, and the greetings and, and sections are, com are comparable to those in Paul's other letters. This morning, I would like to share with you the very pr first part of Paul's letter in chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, or the epistles to the Romans on how to walk right with God. Have you ever seen how a baby or a child starts to learn how, how to walk? When my daughter Nisa started to learn to walk to, during her eight months, I taught her first how to stand strong and learn to balance by herself. I intended not to buy a walker. I would like to I would like her to learn to stand and balance not depending on a walker. Praise God. She learned fast. Slowly she would stand in a distance and ask her to come to me. At first she would feel a bit uh, scared, but was able to walk slowly and I would fetch her as she reaches for me. Then she will be very happy. She would, she would stand, walk, and fall until she was able to walk right. During the process of teaching her to walk right, as a father or parent, I've learned that in order for her to walk right is to win her faith and trust along ups and down of walking right. I believe we all can relate from this process of learning to walk in our message this morning about our salvation. Brothers and sisters, from the time you've heard the gospel of Jesus and accepted the truth of the gospel, accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, have you come to a point and asked yourself, is it enough just to be saved? Or after knowing that you're saved, is that all? Is that all after after being saved? Is that finished? Wala na? Uh, have you have you come to think of the possibility that when you start following Christ and ask, "Am I right with God? Am I in the right path?" Uh, did I make a right decision? I believe that these questions are mostly asked about our Christian faith. But what is your response to it? Let's see further in Paul's letter how we can know for sure that we're, we're right with him. Let us discover together. Paul introduced three C's in verses 1 to 17 to know what, to know that we are right with God. The first C, calling. Know your calling. Let's read uh, chap uh, chapter 1, 1 to 7. 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophet in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness and appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him we, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called belong to Jesus Christ. To all Rome who are loved by God and called to be his people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you notice the word called was mentioned three three times from verses one to seven. Paul uses these uh, seven verses to introduce himself and to let the Roman believers know of his calling. Paul referred himself as a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart of the gospel. The word servant in Greek is doulos or dulo. I hope I pronounced it right. In the New Testament, it is frequently used to designate a master's slave, but also follower of Christ. In some versions, they use bond slave of Christ. The expression servant of Christ is to be found in the Jewish Old Testament scriptures so that it does not connote a, a slave, but honor and privilege. It was used in the Old Testament and associated with famous old OT uh, personalities, including such great men like Moses. Uh, you can find it in, in Joshua uh, 14.7. David. Check on Mass, uh, Psalms uh, chapter 89, verse 3. Uh, and Elijah. Uh, all these men were servants of the Lord. It was indeed a great honor uh, to use of the expression servant of Christ uh, and a privilege to serve our Lord. In our present time, we also use this servant of Christ. No. We also use this in Tagalog. The words uh, goes like uh, tagapaglingkod ng Panginoon or walang hamak na tagapaglingkod ng Panginoon. Uh, in Chinese, uh, we, we call it, we say it siyongte uh, e pokdin. No. It was not Paul desire to place himself among venerated OT saints or to express his gratitude to be a servant of Christ Jesus, but rather to communicate in plain terms of his commitment and devotion to Lord Jesus. Called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel, an apostle from the Greek word apostolos, which means person sent. Paul was converted to Christianity a few years after Jesus' death was set apart for the gospel. To, uh, to explain it simply, a person sent by God to do 
a specific work for the purpose of beginning uh, bringing the gospel, God's special messenger. It's not easy for Paul to, to introduce himself and to say he was an apostle. Why? Because of his personal encounter, because of his, in per, his personal encounter during his travel to Damascus that knocked him off, off his horse. Do you, do you remember this, his story in Acts? Uh, Acts chapter 9, when he was traveling to Damascus, uh, the Lord, uh, he saw, a, he saw a light from, from the heaven falling to his eyes. Paul saw and heard the resurrected Jesus and, ter- and that time, the turning point of his life when 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 he heard the voice of Jesus calling him Paul responded to his calling as an act of obedience in faith this is what verse 5 was saying as the goal of being an apostle is obedience to the call and grace received through Jesus Christ. Acts 9, 5. With the use of the term apostle, Paul moves from his obedience to Christ to his authority to speak on behalf of Christ. It was God who called him to become his spokesman for the gospel. In verse 6, called to belong to Jesus Christ. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Paul was an enemy of Christ when he was saved. Isn't that exactly what we were before? Am I right? We were also enemies of Christ. Am I right also? Sure. Sure it is. We were also enemies of Christ before. We may not like Paul who persecuted Christians, but we were once enemies of Christ who had been slaves to sin. We hated what God wanted us to be, and we don't believe in him. Our last full desire controlled us. The love for the world is more than our love for God. Found in James 4, verse 4. Until such time when when God opened up our eyes, the same thing when Paul had his spiritual eyes open to the reality of who Jesus was and what he has done for him. We may, ne- we may not have the same experience or personal encounter with Jesus, but we are called to belong to Jesus when we turn to, to him. Am I right? If, if I'm, I'm right and you feel it's right, let everybody say, Amen. What Paul is trying to say to all Romans believers and to us, present Christians, is that we all, is that we all belong to Christ and we have a personal relationship with Christ. Again, I will say, to Christ and we have a personal a personal relationship with Christ we were both both with a price first corinthians 6 19 to 20 do you know 
Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And another thing, we are secure in Him. Romans chapter 8, 38 to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death or nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor presence, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In verse 7, Paul says, We are called to be his holy people. To all in Romans who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. To be his holy people, which also means to be righteous people. In another Bible version, they use the word saints. This word saints actually means holy ones, which also means to be set apart for a specific purpose. Again, I will say, Paul was once an enemy of Christ. Likewise, we were once sinners. But we and Paul received the grace of God's forgiveness and are called to, to be set apart, called to be righteous in following Christ. In Peter 2 verse 9, says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. We are ought to be holy because the one who called us, the, one, the God that we believe is holy and we also ought to be holy. Brothers and sisters, you might think you may you might think this way about being called to be his holy people or righteous people. Holy people are the pastors, missionaries, and evangelists only. Sila yung mga holy holy or righteous people. Sila yun. Here's the truth. If you, if we consider ourselves Christians and we've been set apart for the gospel, we are his holy people. Isn't it? Isn't it a joy for us to proclaim the death and resurrection of God's son and the forgiveness and reconciliation that people can enjoy through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. What is the application of understanding the call of God for us to walk right with Him? God has a purpose for our lives that we, that will involve both a personal call for the work of His kingdom and a general call to be holy, separated, and distinct in heart and character from the world, fully devoted to His service and His service only. Let me share to you. During my uh, high school, college, and my uh, during my uh, young professional days. Uh, I attended several uh, retreat, and most of the retreat I attended every time during the last 
day uh, of the retreat, there will be a special night. Uh, that night is uh, special because uh, it's a call time. Uh, a call time for everybody. Uh, there's three kind of call calling. First, during that retreat, people attended the first time who accepted the Lord in that retreat. Uh, the first time to receive Christ as their personal uh, Savior. The first calling. People will stand up and share uh, their first call. God called them and they accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Second calling, the calling of those people uh, who have been saved, who have been Christians, understanding their faith, uh, the calling for them uh, for, to serve God faithfully. If they would like to serve Him uh, in a full-time uh, work as their profession, as their status to serve Christ. And the people will stand up and share uh, uh, their life tes testimonies. Third call. Third call is a special calling. A calling like Paul. Paul was called to be a servant, to serve. The second calling is called to be a servant to serve, but not full-time like Paul. Paul was called to be a servant, called to be an apostle. In our, in our uh, present time, people were called to serve God full-time, to work, to serve God as his or her profession, to serve God fully devoted to him, to serve him, to spread the gospel full time, to share and minister to people just like Paul. So there's three calling. As I remember this, as I was preparing this, I remember these three callings uh, as this message was saying. Let's go further to the second C. Second C, concern. Paul concerned for the people, for the people. Uh, who's, who are these people? The Roman believers. Verses 8 to 15. Again, let's read these uh, verses. Verses 8. First, I thank my God to Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. In some texts, uh, it was written, um, proclaimed. No. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you, verse 10, in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now at last by God will the way, uh, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by, by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have Head among the other Gentiles. 14. 
I am obligated that mo both to Greeks and not Greeks, non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am eager, so eager, to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. After having a personal encounter with Jesus, how Christ has changed your life, understanding why you have been saved and come to know and understand why we are following Christ and knowing your calling means. Have you ever thought of being concerned with the needs of people physically, financially, and spatially, spiritually? May it be inside or outside the church, your family, your relatives, or friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, a student or an ordinary person, you and I were not called to share the gospel to rocks, trees, your, uh, your pets, birds, or fishes inside your house, inside the aquarium. Our concern is the heart and soul of real flesh and blood people. Remember that song back in the 80s when I was still in high school entitled People Need the Lord. I hope everybody knows this song. Uh, the chorus, People Need the Lord. It was sung by Steve Green. He was one of my, my favorite Christian artists. Paul was so concerned and eager to share the gospel to the people of Rome and to anyone else that would listen to the story that could and would change their lives. Let us learn from Paul through his concern uh, for the people of Rome, helping them to walk right with God. First, by giving thanks for other Christians, verses 8 to 10, Paul prayed with thanksgiving for the church in Rome because their faith is reported to the whole world. See, Paul prayed and give thanks for the church, those people who, who proclaim uh, the gospel. Have you prayed for the people or the people in the church or your friends who was able to uh, proclaim or share the message of Jesus Christ? Did you pray for giving thanks for them? Paul prayed for his concern of visiting them, which shows his which shows his sincerity for them. Paul prayed of his concern how he could go and visit them. Uh, keep on praying. Uh, the possibility, uh, her, his eagerness to go and see them. Second, by seeking to encourage other Christians. Verse 11 to 13. Paul concern of strengthening them spiritually by imparting uh, some spiritual gifts to make them strong and be mutually encouraged by each other. 
Paul wants us to learn to encourage other Christians, uh, how we can uh, nurture them, uh, how we can help them spiritually, how we can help them, encourage them to grow. Paul concerns of being part of the spiritual blessing and growth as an evidence of his genuine love and care for them. Third, by understanding the universality of the offer of the gospel. Verse 13 to 15. Paul concerned of his eagerness to preach the gospel is not exclusive, is not exclusive, but for all. You know, sometimes we were uh, very also exclusive when we share the gospel. We would only share uh, if we know the people, if we are in the mood, or we just, we pick people for short. No. Paul concerned of his eagerness to preach the gospel is not exclusive. It's for all. Para sa lahat. Ho taike. No matter who you are, rich or poor, it's for all. As Paul says, I am obligated both to Greek and non-Greeks, but to the wise and the foolish. Paul was so concerned about the soul of the people of Rome, even if he has not been there yet. Church family, are you concerned for the eternal soul of the people around you? Have you, have you thought about your family, friends, your work personnel, your neighbors who still haven't heard the gospel? Or the good news about Jesus? Do we, do we shed tears over them? Are we praying for them? Do we have their best interests at heart? Have you thought of them? If we love them, then we must be concerned about their eternal eternal destinies. If we want the very best for them, then why wouldn't we nurture relationship that allow us to gracefully and lovingly share the good news? Are we concerned about people? Finally, the third C, commitment. Commitment to the gospel, verse 16 to 17. Let's read the last two verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness Righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What kind of commitment do the gospel made Paul walk right with God? Verse 16, 17. We will learn why he was committed to gospel. What made him to be committed to the gospel. Paul theme in the book of Romans is the good news that comes from God. How sinner can be delivered from his righteous judgments and be reconciled to him. This is called salvation. Here Paul tell us in verse 15 why he was so eager to preach the gospel. Why? Because Paul has a strong stand of commitment to the gospel. Why? Because he or Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. 
there was once a Scottish theologian by the name James S. Stewart. He commented on verse 16. He said, There is no sense in declaring that you're not ashamed of something unless you've been tempted to feel ashamed of it. Think about that for a minute. Again, think it over again and again. We think Paul as inv invincible, yet he was human. Peter, that solid rock, boldly claimed that he would never deny Christ. And then he did three times. It's quite comfortable to say that we're not ashamed of the gospel. No. Uh, for short, yeah, mabilis sabihin, no? It's easy to, to say, oh, hindi ako nahihiya. Uh, ano yung totoo? When it comes in reality. No? It's, it's not easy, no? Again, I will say, it's quite comfortable to say that we're not ashamed of the gospel. But may I ask you to think back over the last few days or the last 48 hours or the last 24 hours or maybe just a few hours ago. And see if there was an opportunity for us to share a word of hope and encouragement in the name of Jesus. Or perhaps even to say, Jesus loves you, my friend. Kaibigan, mahal ka ng Panginoon. Siyong te tiyandi, yaso tiyandi. In a place for, in, in place of saying thank you or take care. And we didn't. No. If you're a Christian today, then there was a moment in time when someone was not ashamed to share the gospel with you. Maybe it was your pastor, your mother, your father, your grandmother, or your grandfather. Maybe it was your teacher, a coach, your close friend. At some point in your life, that person was not ashamed of the gospel and shared it with you. And in that moment, it was the power of God's salvation. And in that instance, we went from being consigned to accept and receive the gospel of salvation. It's because of the power of God's of God's salvation. Why Paul was why was Paul not ashamed to the gospel? Because for Paul, Paul knows the power of God's for salvation. And Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the manner through which people are saved. For whoever is ashamed of me and my word is this in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark chapter 8 verse 38. Verse 17, as he says, Paul says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just it is written. The righteous will live by faith. What does Paul mean? Paul mentioned believing or faith several times in these two verses. To everyone who believes, from faith to faith, the righteous 
man shall live by faith. If salvation comes from faith plus good work, then it's not good news. Because you could never know whether you have a you have piled up enough good works to qualify. But if God declares guilty sinners to be righteous or justified, the instance they believe, and that is good news. Because Paul knows and understands the gospel is the good news that God has revealed to us how we can be rescued from the wrath to come. You can find it in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. It is the very power of God to save everyone who believes because in it God reveals his perfect righteousness will put to the account of the guilty sinner who trusts in Christ. I pray that we will understand the gospel, believe it personally, preach it ourselves every day, and proclaim it un unashamedly to this lost world. Lastly, what made Paul to be committed to the gospel? Let me share an illustration by Lou Nichols, a missionary author. Marriage, commitment by license and love. He said, uh, Lou Nicole said, When my wife and I got married in 1960, we made a commitment to one another that was sealed by a legal contract. We call it marriage license. But as the years go by, we don't maintain that commitment to one another because of a contract. We remain committed because of the love that has grown out of our commitment. That li license now is a keepsake instead of a contract. If you view your commitment to Christ as something that forces you to wait patiently while God does his thing, you will eventually give up and walk away. Paul's commitment to the gospel is because of the love has grown out his commitment. To walk right with God, first is to know your calling. Secondly, to have concern for people around you who need the Lord. And lastly, to be committed to the gospel. In my conclusion, let me share to you a quote from mountainhills.org. Paul was called by God. You and I have been called by God. Paul was concerned for people. We should be concerned for people. People was committed to the gospel. We should be committed to the gospel. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your message, Lord God, how Paul walked right with you. Help us, Lord, to know our calling. Help us, Lord, to be uh, concerned to other people, especially for those lost ones, our friends, our relatives, or the people around us, Lord God. Help us to be sensitive. Help us, Lord, to be committed and rooted in your word. Help us, Lord. Help us to me meditate your word. There are a lot of people need you, Lord, especially on this time of pandemic, Lord. Help us, Lord, how we could reach out to them. And we continue to pray for those uh, people who who have who are suffering right now in the typhoon of death people are lost they need help spiritually physically lord we pray that 
we could do something to reach out to them, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our first Sunday of the month of January, year 2022. Today is the first Sunday and the first communion Sunday for the year 2022. Every time when we all gather together during the communion, we always heard this word twice. Do this in remembrance of me. Have you ever asked or wondered what really we should remember? The bread that we partake or the cup that we drink? What does Jesus really want us to remember? There are two important things Jesus wants us to remember when we take the communion. First, remember the process. Jesus wants us the, to remember the process of his death as memorial before God. Means the process from the time Jesus was talking to his disciple, uh, but the disciples can't understand during the Last Supper when Jesus sharing uh, to, the, to the disciple, and yet they still don't understand. And from that time on, the journey of his death to the cross began. God wants us to remember how he suffered how his journey began up until uh, to the cross. God wants us to remember that time. Who sees the signs and blesses us, nourishing us with Christ's body and blood by the Holy Spirit. Second, remember the purpose What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Jesus wants us to remember the purpose of his death. To free us from the spiritual slavery and to bring those who receive it to eternal life with our Lord in heaven. And also bring the fulfillment of his promises. As we all gather together, observe communion prayerfully and thoughtfully, considering together what the Lord has done for us. Shall we get ready and prepare our heart, taking the communion as we remember our Lord Jesus Christ? As I read, As I read in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, if you have your Bible with you, uh, please open it and read it with me. Shall we take the bread in your hands? For I receive from the Lord that I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this bread. Symbolize your body, Lord God, how you have suffered for us through your body, Lord God. It was broken for us. And on this day, as we remember you, how you, uh, how you, how you suffer, die for the sake of us, Lord God. 
Lord, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Shall we partake the bread? Shall we lift the cup in the same way after supper? He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat and this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this cup as we drink it, Lord God. Lord, we pray and give thanks for this blood, this juice represent as your blood who, who shed for us, for our sins, to clean us, to separate us, to set us apart. Oh Lord, we thank you, Lord God. And through your blood, there is promises not only to heal us from our sin, but to heal us from any sickness and the power of your blood, Lord God. We pray and give thanks to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we drink? Father, we come to your presence as we all together celebrate this communion, as we remember you died for us. Take the bread, take the cup, represent us your blood, cleanse us. We remember you, how you have suffered for us, for the sake of us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. Help us to live every day and know our calling. Know what is right for us to live. Lord Jesus, help us, Lord, to remember you every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And as we receive your blessing, Lord Jesus, as we lift our hands together, Lord, as we receive the benediction, help us, Lord. Give us your blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. God bless. Jesus loves you all. Amen. Amen.